morning, everyone. Um, in uh, today's session, we will start a new chapter of our lecture. Um, we have so far been talking about the nutrient cycles at the very beginning to give that all the framework and uh, to learn that there are these different pools and these different transformations and what they are. And probably by that time, most of you were not very familiar with all these uh, different pools and what they are and what the transformations uh, are. Uh, then we started looking at um, the different pools and how much is in there, what is it actually in those boxes. And uh, in the last few sessions, we've been talking about these nutrient transformations, this arrow between the boxes, um, and learned what actually controls nutrient uh, availability and transformation in soil. And now we're taking the next step. Now we're actually interested in what environmental factors, exogenous factors, control how much of a certain nutrient form and how these nutrient forms uh, interact and how they are transformed uh, into one another uh, are affected, um, for instance, by, and now we look at those uh, different factors, by clay mineral uh, types and contents, by organic matter contents, by cation exchange capacity, soil moisture aeration, etc., etc. So in this and next session, part of next session, we'll go through these different factors um, and uh, have to bear in mind what, what we learned in the f past few sessions um, and take that a step forward. Uh, the clay content is definitely a driving factor for a lot of different um, pool transformations and pool sizes. And just as an example, I can only give you examples of, of all these um, uh, cause and effect relationships. Um, and one uh, important one is that um, usually if we have a change in clay content or change in texture towards more clay in the soil, uh, we usually find that nutrient contents increase. Um, and uh, here you see the example for phosphorus. The total phosphorus content increased from a sandy soil towards a clay soil quite considerably, more than doubled the phosphorus content. Um, and uh, uh, that is probably valid for most nutrients because most nutrients are in either held by, uh, um, retained by, by uh, clay minerals, if these are clay minerals that actually have uh, cation exchange capacity, um, or they are fixed and retained in an unavailable form and total phosphorus, of course, entails all the phosphorus forms, um, or weathering products are usually coming from, from clay minerals and not from quartz or, or coarse-sized uh, um, soil particles. So that's, that's a very typical relationship with more clay, you have uh, more nutrients, more total nutrients. Not necessarily available nutrients, that's a different story. So you always have to, you, you realize already the differences between different pools and, and uh, status of soil nutrients. Um, with higher clay contents, usually also the cation exchange capacity uh, increases. Um, and that exactly relates to what I just said, that usually with more clay, you have um, more negative charges because sand really doesn't have any permanent charge. It also does not not have much uh, uh, variable charge. Practically, what exerts cation exchange capacity is the clay. Uh, so with more clay, you usually have more CC. However, that does not need to be very pronounced if you have the wrong type of clay mineral, and we've been talking about that a lot already. So if you have um, gypsites or, uh, or kaolinites, they don't have much or even any variable charge, and they have a uh, permanent charge, and they have a very high point of zero net charge, so they usually uh, contribute very little to cation exchange capacity. Which one of the two, the gypsite or the kaolinite, has uh, no permanent charge? Remember? What's, what's the gypsite? I'm not, what's in there? What, what kind of secondary? Hmm? It's an aluminum oxide, yeah, whereas the kaolinite is a one-to-one -one clay mineral. Um, and which of the two has no permanent charge but only variable charge? The 
weather? No, the other one. The, 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 the Gibbs side. Oh, the Gibbs side. So the aluminum oxide has only variable charge uh, and no permanent charge, whereas the kaolinite has some permanent charge, but not much. Um, so uh, the Gibbs side usually doesn't contribute at all um, to, uh, uh, to cation exchange capacity uh, unless the pH is very, very high, which is, of course, very unusual. So here you see an example uh, where this author has plotted the clay percent for the soils found, and this was in, uh, in the Amazon basin. Uh, and, and you see the range is pretty high from only 10% clay to 90% clay. So this is really stretches a, a huge spectrum of clay uh, percentages. And the, what they call the T-value in 1960s, uh, which is cation exchange capacity, um, doesn't, really, doesn't really increase much. We would, we would expect a much steeper increase uh, of cation exchange capacity with, with a lot of clay difference. But you see here the difference between having 10-20% clay and having 60-70-80% clay is not all that much. It's probably not even a significant, uh, uh, very significant increase here. And definitely the slope is, is very low. Uh, so it's not only the clay percent, the proportion of uh, the soil that is clay, but also the clay mineralogy uh, is, uh, determines cation exchange capacity. Um, not only the amounts change of nutrients, but also the proportion of different pools. And this is what, what this slide should indicate that that can happen. So here again, our sand, loam, and clay from before, and now the organic phosphorus as percent of the total. Before we saw that the total phosphorus content increases from a sandy soil towards a clay soil, now we see that also the proportion of organic inorganic changes. It seems that the sand in this case here had a lower proportion of organic phosphorus and the clay had a, has a higher proportion of organic phosphorus. Well, this is really only an example. It's not really something that you should uh, memorize because uh, it can go the other way as well depending on the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. For other nutrients it can be different. But, um, but these are this are, so should sensitize you towards the fact that uh, the, the proportion of clay has profound uh, influences on all kinds of uh, properties of nutrients in soil. The amount, the forms, cation exchange capacity, how it interacts with soil, etc., etc. Um, with higher nutrient contents, very often the availability uh, can decrease uh, with. Uh, for some nutrients and, and we can easily explain why that is for instance for ammonium and potassium because something like fixation exists where the ammonium and potassium really fits nicely into, um, into the interlays of 2 to 1 clay minerals and we know now the infamous phosphate interaction with uh, oxides and, and um, uh, clay minerals that we have there a uh, covalent bondage that can lead to a very strong fixation um, uh, so usually for some of these nutrients, depending on the clay mineralogy, but in, in most cases we could safely assume that those nutrients may be uh, uh, less available. Uh, but it can also increase for, um, for other nutrients, uh, usually micronutrients are increased, um, uh, maybe with the exception of molybdenum, which is a negatively charged ion. Uh, here again this example of the type of clay mineralogy that affects for instance, uh, potassium fixation, um, smectites and vermiculites increase the potassium and ammonium fixation. Um, iron and aluminum increases P fixation. Um, high smectite contents lead to calcium and magnesium absorption. So there, there's a lot of different things that can happen and, and you, you should really look at, at the details um, once you have a, a case study and a, a problem set that you're working on. The potassium, here an example how the potassium contents uh, change in a larger survey uh, done by Andrew Sharpley, he's from uh, Penn State or ARS at Penn State. Um, here they looked at total potassium, exchangeable potassium and water soluble potassium. So total potassium obviously is the entire amount of potassium in the soil. Exchangeable potassium is what can be exchanged from the exchange sites, um, absorbed by uh, electrostatic absorption and then the water-soluble potassium that is really floating around um, 
and is not absorbed or very weakly absorbed. And they compared kaolinitic soils. Um, that's our soils that are more highly weathered, like Peter said, uh, and probably uh, more prevalent in humid tropical environments or warmer, uh, warmer and humid climates, mixed, so in between, and smectitic, so soils that are coming from more temperate climates, uh, Great Plains up here somewhere. Um, and you see that the total potassium concentration increases dramatically from kaolinitic soils to smectitic soils, the total potassium concentration. Um, and that is, that is very easy understandable uh, if we know that these kaolinitic soils, they are highly weathered soils where basically a lot of the minerals have been uh, leached out of the soil, whereas the smectitic soils have a lot of the base cations still retained and, uh, and can retain them very well, whereas the kaolinitic soils cannot. Um, if we look at exchangeable potassium, of course, then this goes down pretty much also, um, and, and probably the relationship is not so much different. Um, the jump from here to here is more interesting. Uh, if we say that this, this has a lot of total potassium, but actually, if we can com compare th these two data sets here, that's not really reflected in the exchangeable potassium. And that, that is again the effect of uh, the high potassium and ammonium fixing abilities of these smectites. Um, and uh, uh, so you see that, that very clearly. Um, and the water soluble potassium actually doesn't change too much between the soils, um, which is explainable by uh, the, the um, by the fact that uh, potassium is absorbed in, in many soils um, quite well. Uh, but this is really an, an interesting uh, portion of this data set that despite the fact that uh, the uh, uh, total potassium almost doubles, the exchangeable potassium decreases from these mixed clay mineral soils to the smectitic soils. The next, after um, the clay mineral content and um, mineralogy types of clay minerals, I would say the organic matter is another one of these key elements of soil um, that controls soil nutrient availability. And we have, we have recognized that all along. And uh, here we have a whole slew of different uh, um, target variables that organic matter can affect. Source of slow releasing nutrients uh, is organic matter, um, definitely stabilization. It can stabilize soil structure, biological function, cation exchange capacity. We've reiterated that a lot of times and so on. And we go through this uh, now uh, a bit slow, more slowly. So it's definitely um, ha uh, promote aggregate stability or soil stability. And here's an example from South America and Africa that uh, Christian Feller uh, compiled. Um, here you see the carbon content in the soil. It's also fairly a uh, reasonable wide range from less than 1% um, carbon to uh, uh, about 5% carbon. Probably in an agricultural soil you won't find any much more than and 5% carbon, that's already pretty high. Um, and you see that there's, uh, in terms of the instability, structural instability, I'm not really sure why they, they plot instability rather than stability. But anyhow, so in, in terms of the instability of the uh, soil, you see a, a negative relationship. Um, so the soil becomes more instable with lower amounts of uh, soil carbon. And, and that is usually um, the case. Does anybody of you know where that is not so much the case? Which soils have a very high stability, um, aggregate stability, rather irrespective of their organic matter content? Which soils are very, very strongly aggregated, usually? Have you heard about that? <clears throat> Maybe not, but oxysols, um, so highly weathered soils, uh, Western Kenya, uh, the Amazon, uh, what have you. Um, a lot of the humid tropics, lowland tropics have, have oxysols. And one characteristic is that they're very, very strongly aggregated. 
Um, in most cases, a higher organic matter content can still promote a higher aggregate stability, but there are reports that it didn't matter at all how much soil organic matter was in there, whether there was 1% or 5%, aggregate stability was the same. Um, because they, they have high clay contents and they have aluminum bridges uh, between the, the, uh, um, the, the aggregates, and they're, they're very, very strongly aggregated. By the way, that they have they have a very peculiar uh, behavior. Have you have you heard about that? This this strong aggregation in terms of water conductivity. Some people call them pseudo sand. They they have eighty percent clay, but actually, if you feel if you have them in your hand, you think it's sand. You you even crush them, and the aggregates are so so strong that you you feel it, and and you think you have a sand in your hand. Um, and that means also for uh, water transport and solute transport, they behave. Although they have 80% clay, they, they can behave similar to a sand. A very high uh, hydraulic conductivity. Water is leaching through them with a, with a uh, conductivity that, that is uh, very, very high and cannot be explained really by, uh, by anything than, than a very strong aggregation because uh, calculations show that if you would calculate it on, based on their clay content and assume a homogeneous um, mixture of, of the, uh, the clay, then uh, it, it takes uh, years for, for water to penetrate uh, a meter depth. But uh, with, this, with this strong aggregation, it, it uh, can take just five minutes or ten minutes that uh, uh, water percolates maybe to 40, 40 centimeters. It's, it's very rapid infiltration. Um, so that, there are exceptions to that, but uh, for most cases, especially sandier soils, uh, this is very, very pronounced relationship. The organic matter has also a pronounced effect on bulk density. Here, soil organic matter uh, content again from about 2% to 12%. To um, that probably includes some, uh, some northern soils, um, yeah, probably poultry manure amendments. Uh, so that, that cannot be really a ag tropical agricultural soil anymore. And you see here um, the bulk density decreases from maximum values from 1.4 gram per cubic centimeter uh, to down to uh, 0 0.6 uh, with an increase in carbon content. That's also uh, very conducive, of course, to um, root penetration. So it's a very important parameter. And I think that's also, as far as I know, um, one, of the, uh, um, one of the parameters that uh, are being developed to assess something that we now call soil health, uh, soil bulk density, a lower bulk density in a given soil uh, indicates uh, probably that, uh, uh, that soil health and productivity is better. Um, other parameters are here, for instance, the uh, exchangeable basis. Uh, with higher carbon concentration in the soil, we have also a uh, higher um, amount of, uh, of exchangeable basis, and we have um, a higher amount of mineralizable nitrogen. So usually with higher carbon contents in soil organic matter, uh, we have a better soil fertility. Um, this, is, this is pretty standard knowledge, so um, I just want to give you a few concrete uh, graphs to, to support this. Uh, what is maybe less known is that um, the availability of also micronutrients can be increased um, through organic matter. Uh, through, uh, very often through complexation. And here are two examples for iron and manganese where the application of rice straw in peat moss uh, increased the, uh, the uh, um, availability of uh, iron by one order of magnitude. For manganese, this increase was not that uh, pronounced. Um, but we already know, and I, I stress this repeatedly, that for instance, copper is one of these elements where actually higher organic matter contents decrease the availability. So very often standard thing is if you have a, a peat, usually vegetation is constrained by uh, copper availability. And if you, um, if you convert um, peat or high organic matter soils into agricultural soils, one, one problem that you run into frequently is copper, uh, copper limitation. Um, Another important factor that uh, um, controls 
uh, soil fertility and nutrient availability is the cation exchange capacity. We, we have talked about that frequently and it, it is a very, very important measurement and, uh, and parameter for soil fertility. And here let's, let's compare that in the context of different soil types and different uh, uh, climates around the world. Here we have a warm humid climate with ultisols, a cool humid uh, climate with um, alfisols, uh, with a mollisol, semi-arid, and then very arid, for instance, a, um, uh, a nataragate, these are these uh, sodic soils. Um, and you see here the canyon exchange capacity increases from somewhere around 30 to 120 millimole charge per kilogram uh, from the ultisol to the alfisol to the uh, mollisol, and then practically this stays the same in the uh, in this uh, solar nets or natragib, um, whereas the anion exchange capacity decreases from usually fairly high levels, they can be even can even exceed the canyon exchange capacity. Um, uh, over the uh, uh, cool humid can maybe a bit higher because of the clay mineralogy, but then definitely it decreases with those soils that um, have uh, uh, the uh, two to one clay minerals in in the uh, arid soils that have then also high pH, usually the anion exchange capacity is very, very low. Base saturation, we know there is a low pH in, uh, in these, uh, usually in these highly weathered soils that have to begin with a low cation exchange capacity. Uh, and usually that is accompanied by low base saturation. Uh, base saturation goes up with, uh, with a higher pH and usually around seven or higher um, it has to be, or it is usually 100%. Uh, so what we take away from this is that usually the soil fertility in general is, is lower, um, though it can be managed, uh, it's usually lower in these soils that have a low cation exchange capacity, but it's higher in the soils that have a higher cation exchange capacity. Uh, here in these soils, why, why do you think I made a minus here um, in these arid soils? If they have such a uh, nice high base saturation and a nice uh, high cation exchange capacity. What would you think is constraining uh, soil fertility here? Apart from maybe uh, that there's no water. Um, but if we would irrigate <coughs> them, what, what would be a problem in these soils? pH is really high. pH is very high, and what, what does that mean? Peter? Well, the <coughs> macronutrient availability is going to be limited, and also there's high salt content. High salt content, yeah. So <coughs> um, you would expect a very high salt content, and actually uh, that is most of the macronutrients. So usually, actually, you have a lot of calcium and magnesium, potassium available. Um, but, but you're right in a sense there, well, there is a lot available of potassium, calcium, and magnesium. But there's also a lot of sodium. Uh, they all they all contribute to the salt content. You have a high electric conductivity, which is not very nice for the plants. They have they have a threshold um, above four millisiemens per decimeter or something like that. Um, usually, not much grows apart from halophytes, uh, and tomatoes have even a lower lower threshold or lettuce or so. Um, but but you're right. If you have if you have, for instance, a high sodium concentration, uh, then by, um, by nutrient imbalances and imbalances at the uptake, that suppresses the uptake of other uh, base cations. And we'll talk about that later. Um, but that can happen, that you actually have uh, um, a limitation of calcium and potassium availability, not because there is nothing, there is quite a lot, but there's so much more sodium that the plant has really difficulties taking up the potassium. That can happen. These are a competition at uptake, and, and this is something we'll, we'll discuss in detail later. This is a very important aspect. Yeah, that was uh, very important. Um, here are some, some aspects and, um, you'll, of, of how pH, cation exchange capacity, and base saturation interplay. Um, We've talked about that earlier in the context of looking at what potential and effective cation exchange capacity is. And Joseph actually will, um, will teach you that uh, a respective group every week 
about this concept. It's very important to understand that. Um, and here, for instance, an example, and, and we might want to, to dwell a little bit on this, just to, to make sure we understand that best. Um, here, in this soil, which I call here soil A, uh, we have a certain cation exchange capacity. In this case, it's just a model, um, just 20 uh, centimol uh, charge per kilogram. Um, and then we increase the pH from 5.5 to 6.5. Uh, and that increases the uh, base saturation from 50 to 80 percent. Um, and then we have a soil B here that has a lower cannon exchange capacity, half, it has only 10 uh, centimol per kilogram, um, but it has a pH as high as the 6.5 here uh, of soil A in this second state. Um, and it has a uh, similarly high 80% base saturation. Um, and you see here a, uh, that, that this soil, this soil B, has a lower amount of um, base forming cations than this soil A at a lower pH. So you cannot really judge from just base saturation uh, how, much, how many available cations there are. Um, it's really determined by the interplay between cation exchange capacity and pH. And, and that is also the reason why we are interested in both the effective, or why we could be interested in both the effective and the, the potential cation exchange capacity. Um, uh, Joseph, can you, can you maybe enlighten us what, what that means in the context of, of your experiment that you're doing in the lab? Um, what, what two things can happen if you, in, in your context, you, you add um, you add an organic material to soil and you want to know uh, what the effect is on cation exchange capacity. What, what two things can happen if you add organic matter to soil? Um, at no point when you add the organic matter there is a, um, there is a possibility of having a, an and uh, there is uh, also an indication of change of the, of, of the pH. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And uh, uh, when you are measuring, when you are measuring the, um, the nutrient content, it, it, it might be tricky when the, the, the pH changes, especially in the natural environment. Yeah, exactly. So. You might, with the additions, just to repeat that quickly, uh, with the additions you might increase the exchange sites, but you also in, may be changing the pH. And, and both together, you, you, if you measure the cation exchange capacity before and after, you really don't know what's your effect of a higher cation exchange capacity. The, the, uh, the, the reason for that was that more exchange site, or was that that you changed the pH? So that, that is why these these two, um, as, uh, these two parameters or these two um, aspects of, of soil, the, the percent of base cations and the pH and the cation exchange capacity, why they're, they're, they're intricately linked. Um, and that's why we're very often interested in, in teasing apart what, what the effect was of, of a management intervention um, to understand better what we actually did with our soil. Um, the cation exchange capacity is also an important buffer for protons or acidity, um, and that becomes important in the context of um, yeah, what, what are sources of acidity in the soil? How, how do we get protons in soil and potentially a gradual decrease of pH over time? Different scenarios, think, think big. Acid rain, so anthropogenic emissions <laughs> from coal burning, sulfates, uh, or from nitrous oxides, car emissions, uh, nitric acid. So acid rain is a, is a source of protons. Other sources? Joseph? Uh, yeah, so any mineralization will um, produce uh, CO2. In, in the soil atmosphere, which is then in equilibrium with the soil solution, which decreases the pH. Yeah, some mineralization. Uh, 
other sources of protons or acidity? What else can happen there? Uh, nitrogen fixation through legumes. I'm not exactly sure how you get production of hydrogen ions, but that's said to occur. Yeah, um, legumes are, are uh, very often decrease the pH in the rhizosphere and, and nitrogen fixation is, is one of the, the issues there. That's right, yeah, exactly. So rhizosphere processes, uh, something else. Fertilizer very often. Um, nitrification of ammonium increases protons. Ammonium plus water uh, gives uh, protons plus nitrate. So if you um, apply ammonium sulfate or an ammonium product or urea, um, then usually you, you're getting protons uh, and that leads to acidification. Well, there might be other, other things, um, but that's, that's probably the most important <coughs> of the different categories. So fertilizer application, anthropogenic emissions, um, mineralization of organic matter. Um, these, these are probably very important processes. So all of these uh, yield protons and they are buffered in the soil to varying extents and the area that of solid pH that is for us the most important, so somewhere between 4.5 and, and 6.57, uh, that is the area in soil, uh, the pH range where um, the uh, buffer system is dominated by cation exchange capacity. Whereas, uh, around 6 or 5.5, there are no carbonates around anymore. Um, and only down here, uh, it starts that aluminum and iron are, are buffering um, protons. So somewhere in between, it's really the cation exchange capacity that uh, buffers the protons. So it's important if we have a lot of that, then the, the uh, acidification through acid rain, for instance, uh, proceeds much slower than in soils where we have a very uh, low cation exchange capacity. A different topic is um, the soil moisture aeration um, and that has, soil moisture and aeration have a, a wide variety of effects on, on soil and nutrient availability and uh, well the most obvious one is uh, a biological effect on microbial processes. We all know that, that uh, moisture uh, largely controls microbial activity and here is a it's a nice graph that illustrates that for, um, for uh, the nitrogen compounds. Here the percent water filled pore space from very dry soil, 10%, to almost saturation, almost 90 something percent um, water filled pore space. And you see here at the low end of, um, of uh, water availability, we probably have a low activity uh, of nitrification, respiration sets in somewhere here, so these are very, very dry soils, uh, increases then as we increase the, the water content, and then at some point, actually aeration limits microbial activity uh, or respiration, and respiration and nitrification go down, and at that point, around 60-70% water-filled pore space, that's, that's a, usually a, a good number to, to keep in mind, um, the uh, denitrification sets in and reaches their maximum values towards saturation. Uh, so that's a nice diagram that illustrates how uh, water content controls microbial activity in this nitrogen system. Um, this is not only a, um, a phenomenon that we observe in submerged soils or marsh soils or uh, um, valley bottoms that are inundated or so. Uh, this, is, this is something that we observe in many soils actually because soils are not homogeneous. Um, you realize that, that there are cracks here um, and there are big aggregates here uh, and uh, even if we zoom in and look at an aggregate that's not homogeneous there's more packed here, here's a plant root going through an aggregate um, and all of this affects that denitrification is actually possible in microsites in almost any soil. 
even though the entire soil might be, might be uh, aerobic and might be an arable soil, a well-drained soil, uh, we can always have anaerobic microsites. And that can happen in aggregates, like I just explained, um, but also where CO2 is produced uh, by root respiration decomposition of litter. So here, for instance, again, an, an aggregate or aggregate clogs, and you have well-drained, aerated pores, but then you may also have less drained pores where, where um, uh, water filling decreases oxygen content. And here's an example where a uh, research has measured the oxygen content uh, in a profile from the aggregate outside uh, into the inside. And you see there are very low values of oxygen in the inside of this aggregate. And you can then in, uh, easily understand that most likely there's denitrification possible in the inside of the aggregate. Although the entire soil would not indicate that there is um, high water content or the total percent water filled pore space uh, wouldn't indicate that. But microsites could show that. The other, like I said, the other effect that we observe is that um, that decomposition and the production of CO2 actually increases denitrification. And this is an example that shows that um, here the uh, CO2 evolution and here up here the N2O evolution. Um, and we see in uh, a time series days after the, uh, the mulch material was killed and incorporated that we have uh, very low denitrification values in the fallow. But if we incorporated plant residues, here rye and vetch, the N2O values uh, increase rapidly. Um, and that tapers off with, with time. Uh, we have lower amounts of N2O evolution over time. Um, and that can also happen again at microsites. Um, I've seen data where uh, researchers measured N2O evolution over the, in, in the whole soil where they didn't really find a whole lot of N2O evolution. But if they, if they zoomed in closer to leaves of, of legumes, for instance, that are decomposing, and they could find a very nice N2O profile um, with higher concentrations towards the decomposing leaf. Um, and so again, uh, microsites exist that, uh, that can show very high uh, rates of, of denitrification. Um, and uh, I ask you uh, to prepare an assignment looking at the effect of moisture and especially the drying and wetting cycles of, um, of soil moisture on nitrogen mineralization and I would like you to discuss that uh, first in groups. Um, maybe the three of you can go together in the, in the back the four of you and Joseph uh, to Colin the three of you can I'll give you 10-15 uh, minutes to go through the through the different questions and then we'll present uh, it in the plenary. Um, so let's Let's see what we got uh, in, in response to these questions. Um, let me go through here. How does, very simple, we start very simple, how does the change of soil moisture affect nitrogen mineralization? Um, Any of you? Well, um, well, we'll move slowly. <laughs> I guess simply, uh, increase, but, wetting and the drying and rewetting increases the amount of mineralization because it it kind of bumps up the zero order mineralization as well as it kind of <coughs> stimulates a first order mineralization that starts to occur when you have the drying and rewetting. Yeah, so it increases the overall the total amount of uh, of mineralization, and it <coughs> seems also that that different pools are differently um, affected. W what are the different uh, mechanisms that that might explain this increase in total amounts and I, I think they make some original observations but most of them are actually cited only from others um, yes in the back what are what are different mechanisms that they propose that um, when you dry the soil the, you kill off a bunch of the microbes yeah, and so exactly. When, when you wet it again, and they reproduce, they grow back. You've got sort of a younger, fresher microbial population that can produce more. 
mineralized water. Yeah, exactly. So this microbial dyeing, um, that, that's a very popular explanation for this uh, drying and rewetting phenomenon. What are other, other um, explanations that, that they list here? And again, they only list them without really providing basis for, for their existence. Peter, do you want to chime in? They also cite the desorption of soil organic substrates um, during wetting and the increased exposure of organic surface area. Yeah. So basically you have these little chunks of organic matter breaking off the soil surface, being exposed to Yeah, so just physically detachment and exposure uh, that microbes can access it, what they physically couldn't because they were just blocked by, by soil particles. Yeah, so there, there are a few of these explanations that, uh, that they cite without, without really um, providing experimental evidence that, that this actually happened. Um, but what I think a key issue here is uh, what they want to convince us um, about is uh, the effect, what effect the, the drying and the rewetting has on, on stable nitrogen, on, on these more stable end pools. Um, and, and they call that then also the zero order, I guess. Um, well, it creates a second pool of um, nitrogen that can rise more rapidly and makes the, it is less stable and it also makes the zero order pool less stable. Yeah, and so that. quicker as well. Right, so it's, it seems that this, this apparently what they want to tease out of the, their observations from their experiment is that there is this stable pool that also the the rate of mineralization increases, not only the labor pool. And, and maybe that's an indication that it's not, not only the uh, microbes that are dying and, and now being mineralized, uh, but um, that there are some other component, maybe the detachment, uh, that all of a sudden there's, there's more access to more stable pools. Maybe the, the microbes are, are what they call here youthful and, and energetic and they actually uh, race into getting the, the, uh, the more stable and uh, who knows, I mean, what, what the exact process is, um, they, they leave us in the dark still. Um, and just following up on that, what, what are implications, for instance, uh, for the dynamics of, of nitrogen availability and, and possible losses in agroecosystems? What, what, what would you think, what this drying and rewetting and the higher nitrogen mineralization what, what would that mean, Angela? Um, well, if you get dry in your body, um, you're flushing, your um, soil will end out of the soil through bleaching, and then you get a really high um, breakdown of your organic matter. So basically, you're losing a lot of that organic matter. If you keep dry in your body, you lose the nitrogen a lot faster. Yeah, exactly. What, what would you think, when does that happen? very often drying and re-wetting um, in, in the course of the year? Well, let's see. Um, probably during, like, well here, in temperate climate, during, like, summer, where you have, like, summer rains and then, like, a very drought or dryness. And yeah. Again. Yeah. Well, and in and, and the tropics, for instance, just well, get a contrasting yeah, so very often at the onset of the rainy season when you have had, had all this dry season, probably all the microbes are now really dead, and then you have the first rains and, and then they have this mineralization flush at the beginning of the, the rainy season. And uh, very often it also happens that this comes then at a time when the, the plants cannot really use it. Uh, very, I mean, at the onset of the rains, um, that you get these flushes of nitrogen mineralization and there is no crop at that point. Um, so you're losing a lot of nitrogen uh, in these periods of, of the year. If it happens during peak uptake of nitrogen in, in our summers, that might be fine. Um, but uh, that might not be always the case. Um, and it's definitely something we cannot really influence. I mean, we can hold our umbrella a little bit over the crop, or, uh, we, but, but it, it, it's not really works uh, that way. Uh, for irrigation system, that is something that you can maybe manage and be aware of, uh, that you should not induce that 
at times at least when you actually are not interested in a high nitrogen availability. Yeah, that sounds very good. I think we'll, we understood that much better now. Let's, let's look at uh, some chemical processes here. Um, so biological, we understand very well that that happens. Uh, but it seems also that um, soil moisture and aeration has uh, effect on, uh, on uh, adsorption that is not related to any biological phenomena. Here you see uh, two different ecosystem temperate and tropical and subtropical um, and a survey of different, uh, of different soils and depicted is here the potassium fixation, the percent. Um, in temperate climates under wet conditions uh, about 25 percent and under dry conditions 68 percent. Um, also in tropical and subtropical it seems that uh, can still increase though the clay mineralogy is such that there is not so much clay, um, um, potassium fixation to begin with. We know that in temperate climates we have the smectites, elites that actually fix, have the ability to fix a lot of potassium whereas in, in tropical climates with two to one clay mineral, uh, one to one clay minerals and oxides we actually don't have that but also there it happens. So it means that uh, um, that the, the uh, Water status has a pronounced effect on potassium fixation. Why do you think that is? Why is, it, why is there more potassium fixed under drier conditions than under wetter conditions? Having in mind how that is actually fixed. Where is the potassium fixed? Where is the location of that? It's in these in this silicium octa uh, tetra eta rings that it fits snuck into, in the interlayers. And if there's a lot of water, that doesn't shut. And, and if you have less water, that actually shuts and the potassium fits in there and is gone. Uh, if there's a lot of water, then you have a hydration around the potassium and, and, and the, the, the clay minerals actually don't shut and don't, don't fix the potassium. But the drier the soil gets, the more opportunities there are that the potassium is actually locked into these interlayers. Temperature, um, we know all that temperature affects biological re reactions um, and that is of course important for those nutrients that are predominantly or a uh, large portion in organic matter and solid and that is nitrogen, sulfur and phosphorus again. It's always these three um, but of course others that are maybe complex uh, that have maybe also some interactions that are not really in an organic molecule to a large extent but uh, that can be complex uh, might also be affected by the mineralization and temperature. Um, optimum temperature that I've usually quoted for uh, nitrification around 25 to 35 degrees, uh, sulfur mineralization uh, 20 to 40 degrees. Um, for P mineralization well, um, it's hard to find a value there. Uh, nobody's really doing that to a large extent. Uh, why, why is P mineralization a little bit of an iffy, iffy process to quantify? W what's a challenge for determining P mineralization? Angela, it's your, it's your topic. Yeah. How do you determine nitrogen and sulfur mineralization? Well, actually, I should ask the others, but and, and how do, would you do that with phosphorus, and what's the challenge? Okay, well, we talked about in nitrogen and sulfur, you have um, basic mineralization um, that's combined with like, carbon breakdown and like, organic pools. But with phosphorus, you have two different kinds of pools, um, one that's related to just like directly bonded to carbon, and then the, um, the phosphorus that is fixed into um, like clay minerals and sort of in Yeah, so, so how do we measure nitrate uh, uh, nitrification or, or mineralization? Andrew, what's, what do we do in lab? Um, how do we measure that? Basically <coughs> measuring the nitrate concentration in the soil over time. Yeah, so we measure time A and time B, and if it increases, 
over this time, we say this is mineralization. If it decreases, we say it's immobilization. So we measure the, the, the nitrate at time A and time B. If we do the same for phosphate, um, we, we probably have a challenge here that at the same time that phosphate appears in the soil, it's also like Angela said, there's another important pool in soil for phosphate, that's this fixed pool. Uh, or, or adsorption is very strong for phosphate. So at the same time as we have release from the organic matter into the salt solution, it's also being fixed by the uh, clay minerals. So this approach of measuring phosphate now and f measuring phosphate tomorrow and the difference is mineralization doesn't really work because it's probably not increasing even though there's mineralization happening because everything that's mineralized, or a large portion of that, is uh, absorbed and it's not being extracted tomorrow and and this is a challenge so you have to devise uh, different <coughs> techniques and, and uh, radioisotopes and uh, um, killing the microbes and so on are all um, <coughs> are all methods that you can employ but this is very very uh, difficult to to measure reliable um, so the temperature we said um, has an effect on on uh, mineralization, you see that here, here's the temperature uh, and the relative rate of, um, of nitrogen mineralization or nitrification. Um, and you see it's going up for these studies and then going down at higher temperatures. But what you also can see, this, comparing these three sites in Australia, in Iowa, and in, in Alberta, Canada, that have different mean annual temperatures than North. Um, in Australia uh, has about 25 degrees Celsius mean annual temperature, Iowa about 10, and Edmonton about 3. Uh, and you see that the optimum or the, the, the maximum rate of nitrification decreases with lower mean annual temperatures. So that means that not only is an effect uh, of the temperature on the uh, nitrification rate, but it seems that the microbes, the microbial population, also adjusts to the habitat that they're in. It seems that the optimum shifts towards lower temperatures when they're adapted to an environment with lower temperatures. So they're just um, uh, better adapted to lower temperatures in, in Edmonton uh, and have therefore a lower optimum. That, I find that extremely interesting. Um, but solid temperature, again, uh, not only has an effect on, um, on the biological portion of the reactions but also on the physical chemical reactions and we see that here for uh, phosphorus fixation for this strong covalent bondage which, uh, between phosphate and, um, and uh, the soil matrix. Um, here over time in an incubation experiment 2, 7, 14, 28, 56 days that's not the important part but the important is the difference between the temperatures uh, 5 degrees, 20 degrees and 35 degrees and it seems that um, the water-soluble phosphate decreases significantly with higher temperatures. So we have a much lower soluble phosphate concentration uh, with 20 than 5 degrees and again it decreases towards 35 degrees and over the whole period here. That means with higher temperatures it seems that we have a higher amount of phosphorus fixation and that can be probably explained just by um, kinetics, everything moves faster with higher temperatures. Also, chemical reactions um, uh, occur much fast, more, much more rapidly um, if, if you have a higher temperature. And that can actually be measured and has a significant impact on phosphorus availability. Uh, the next very important point is the pH. Um, we've already realized uh, with our cation exchange capacity discussion, and we'll pick that up. Uh, in a minute um, that it has an important effect on, on soil fertility but here it has also an important effect on biological um, reactions. Here the pH uh, um, depicted as a, as a factor that um, uh, affects nitrification and uh, overall end mineralization and you see here that in this study end mineralization actually was not really affected by pH whereas nitrification was significantly affected by, by the pH. And that probably can, uh, can be explained by the types of organisms that are, um, that are responsible for these different uh, processes that nitrification is probably 
mainly mediated by specific bacteria that are actually prone to pH effects, whereas mineral and mineralization, almost anybody can do that. Um, so you find always somebody else who can take over. Um, so there, at low pH, probably the fungi are um, doing more of that job, and at higher pH, the bacteria. So it's not, not such a big deal uh, for the pH effects, but for nitrification it is. Actually, higher pH also in increases denitrification, apparently. Here you see uh, an incubation experiment over time, um, and the end losses by uh, denitrification as affected by pH, and you see with, with a low pH of 3.6, you have hardly any losses, but if the pH uh, exceeds a critical uh, threshold here around 4 to 4.5, the, the denitrification losses actually jump up um, quite significantly. There are some interesting effects of uh, pH on the adsorption of uh, potassium and uh, ammonium, for instance, um, and that is partially explained by the uh, competition between aluminum and uh, potassium and ammonium. It seems that at low pH, where we have a lot of alum aluminum in the soil solution, um, these can block the exchange site and stabilize interlayers, and therefore we have at uh, low soil pH, as you see here, we have a low potassium fixation, but as we increase the pH, uh, the proportion of potassium fixation um, uh, increases dramatically. Um, Actually, I wrote this down here. This sometimes is a very, this doesn't really fit into this discussion, but it's, it's a very interesting example that uh, very often we, we lime soils, uh, especially in the tropics when we have acid soils, soils with pH of 4.5 maybe, and uh, the only way of getting really more, more cation exchange capacity, a lower aluminum toxicity in there is to lime. And if we increase these soils, um, then we can decrease the stability of these soils as well uh, because the trivalent aluminum is substituted by divalent calcium and magnesium that is in the lime um, and, uh, and that decreases uh, soil stability. So uh, both indicate it seems that it's not always very good to increase your pH that can backfire on you as well. Uh, so it's very very important to understand these uh, mechanisms to manage your soil uh, properly. And I think we should stop here and uh, we'll continue with these environmental factors. Just a few more uh, subjects, uh, but for the pH I want to have um, really enough time to, to discuss that with you. Uh, and then we'll uh, move into the next topic on next Tuesday and we'll see each other this afternoon for the lab. Um, and please have a look at the lab experiment that you are being taught on this afternoon, so you're all prepared to start writing. Thank you very much.